time to go to sixth grade, and you bring your kid up there and drop him off, and he goes in, and you think to yourself, there are so many kids at that middle school, whether it be north or south, 900 kids, and you watch them all going in. And you think about what a big deal it is for them to have to go into the schoolroom and meet all their teachers. You think, man, they've got to learn how to figure, they've got to figure out how to open that locker. And maybe they've never opened a locker before. That seems like a big deal. But then lunchtime comes. And they stand in line, they get their food, they get through the whole line, and now it's time to sit. And they begin looking around, and the question is, who do you get to sit with? A few years later, they'll go to the high school, which is an even bigger school. And, of course, you know, you have even more classrooms, and you have to find everything. Once again, you get to the lunchroom. You get your food. Where are you going to sit? Are you going to be on a sports team? So somebody allows you to sit, you know, whether it be the track team or the football team or the basketball team. Are you a country boy so that you have those folks that you get to sit with? Are you one of those guys who does a lot of the construction stuff and works in the shop so you have friends in that way? Are you related to half the county, like a lot of people seem to be, and so you end up sitting by your cousin, whoever in the world that is? It's oftentimes a tough thing when you go to a new place or you're among people and you've got to decide, how in the world do I fit in and where do I belong? Maybe, maybe you remember after you made it through Sharp Elementary, after you made it through South Middle School, after you made it through Marshall County, as you went to college, and after you graduated college, and now here you are, your first day on a job. You walk in. What do you wear? Who do you talk to? How can you act? Who do you fit in with? It seems like just about every aspect of life that we go through, oftentimes the scariest thing is finding who we fit in with. Martin Luther King Jr., many decades ago, almost 50 years ago, oftentimes would say the most segregated place in America is the church building. And he would say they've desegregated the military, they've desegregated the workplace, they've desegregated the school, but they've never desegregated the church. Well, that may not be that much of an issue in Marshall County. But would you believe that sometimes people in the church feel like they don't belong? Sometimes in the church, people feel like they don't really have a friend. And sometimes they look around and they say, I don't see how in the world that I fit in. Now that seems like a new and modern problem. But we go all the way back to the first century, to the church right outside of Jerusalem, and we read the writings of James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, and guess what? That was an issue even back then. Go ahead and read there, chapter 2, verse 1, and as we read there, you see the problem stated. The problem which happened then, and sometimes even happens now. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, Notice those last two words, with partiality. As you look at the root of the Greek there, it means judging by, a pa by the face. In other words, looking at the person's outside appearance and from there studying and deciding exactly who that person is. That could look in many different ways when we talk about partiality and exactly how it fits in. In the first century, oftentimes, this had to do with race. There was a fellow named Peter, one of the rocks of the early church, as you look there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, a pillar of the early church. And Peter, who had preached the very first gospel sermon, Peter, who had heard that the gospel was for every creature in Mark 16, 15, still had issues of race. And so when he was sent to go and preach to the Gentiles, he hesitated. God had appeared to him in a vision. God had to forcefully send him there. And God had to, through a miracle, cause the Holy Spirit to fall upon the Gentiles. And then it clicked. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, Peter says, Well, I now see that our God does not show partiality. But he will accept everyone who comes to him. If our God is that way, then we as followers of God have to be that way. 
You see, Jesus died for every person. As the children's song says, red, yellow, black, and white, every one of them are precious in Jesus' sight. Sometimes the church is separated by class, social, social structure. You see, as you read here in James chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, you see the issue is there's some who are rich, some who are poor. This wasn't just in the Jerusalem church. You read over in 1 Corinthians 11, the issue was somewhat similar. Those who are rich would oftentimes flaunt their wealth in front of the rest of the church so that everybody could recognize who really controlled the place and everybody could recognize who really mattered, if you will. Meanwhile, those who were poor were told to go sit in the back because you don't make us look as good. And sometimes those who were poor were left starving without anything. And those who were poor were left to feel alone and like they didn't belong. Paul said by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to these folks in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28, that in the Lord's church, while we are all clothed in Christ, Galatians 3, 27, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, this church, the church, the Lord's church, every single person is accepted and every single person is even before God. As we read in Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul once again talking about himself talks about how some people accept folks and they don't accept others. And Jesus says, or Paul says in that passage, excuse me, here is a faithful and true say. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul was letting Timothy and everybody else know that whatever your past is, whatever your family history is, whatever you've done before and repented from, you now are equal in the sight of Jesus. Every one of us, when we come to Jesus, we now belong in the church. We are now important, and we now belong to God. Well, as we look there in verses 2 through 4, you see the illustration which James gives. And as you go through there, you see the guy who's coming in, and he's wearing fine clothing, it says, and a gold ring. More or less, he's wearing what you're supposed to wear in church, Right? When you come to church, you're supposed to dress up. You're supposed to look decent. You're supposed to fit in. Well, he says, you know, you have somebody who comes in and they fit in. As a matter of fact, they're even dressed better than your average person. And James says, and this person comes in. You're happy that he's here. He's a visitor. You treat him in a special way. You give him an honored seat and everything is great. But then James says, here comes in a guy. This guy doesn't measure up to code. He comes in wearing filthy garments. He comes in, perhaps he doesn't smell the way he should. He comes in and perhaps he did not get the message about what you're supposed to wear at church. And James says, that person you treat so very different. You see, back in that day, it's different. He says, these people you're allowed to sit in the back. Today, that's the first pew that fills up, isn't it? You know, it's a little different nowadays than it was in the first century. But he said, this person you try to hide because he doesn't fit in the way that you want him to. And he doesn't belong the way that you think he ought to belong. And he says, when you do these things, you sin. I probably have shared with you before a story that I had growing up. Uh, a fellow showed up at church. And this is, of course, when I was very young, probably early 1980s. And when I first recognized him, his name was Larry, was because I was walking back into classrooms. It was a large congregation. Our congregation numbered about six to 800, depending on the price of oil at the time. That's the way Odessa worked. When I went, walked into back classrooms, I noticed there was a motorcycle in one of the classrooms. Well, you know, when you're a 10-year-old kid, that's an interesting thing. And, you know, I got to looking around and noticed there was a guy coming to church wearing all leather. He had quite a few tattoos. He was unusual looking. And the preacher had run across him and had invited him to church. And to me, it was such a strange thing because he sure did not fit into our church. And back then in the 80s, it's a different thing than now. I thought, man, here's a guy on a motorcycle. You know, here's a guy wearing all leather. You know, what does that mean? You know, I had matured to the point where I realized, man, I wish I was that guy, you know. 
Back then, you're at that point. It seems so strange because he didn't wear what you're supposed to wear, and he didn't act the way you're supposed to act. And I thought, he really doesn't belong here. And so people acted really strange around him. Well, the preacher studied with Larry, and he worked with Larry. Larry is still alive. Larry became a missionary, went to Papua New Guinea, went, worked, went to Tanzania, uh, today works in Niger. And he works in Africa with uh, many of the street children, and he has done much more for the kingdom of God than I ever have. But you know, if I would have been in charge of the church way back then, boy, that would have been a mistake. But if I had been in charge of the church, I would say, you don't belong. We don't need that kind of person. And how in the world are we allowing a person to bring a motorcycle into a building? All this doesn't match up the way it should. But you see, my preconceived notions, my judging by a person's face, could have set the kingdom back. How often are we that way? How often have you and I seen somebody walk into the church building and we thought to ourselves, that person doesn't fit the profile of what I think a Christian ought to be? How often have we been in the neighborhood or maybe been at Walmart or been somewhere and we see somebody and we don't even think to invite them to church because they sure don't meet our profile? How many times have we been in the congregation and before services or after services, we talk to our friends and maybe we even stay several minutes after, but if you talk to us when we get in the car, we actually haven't talked to anybody different than who we usually talk to. We all have our group of friends. We all have the people that we sit around. We all have our usual conversations with the usual people. And how often does somebody walk into the church, sit alone, and walk out afterwards, and nobody's let them know that they're special? Nobody's let them know that they're welcome. Nobody's given them an opportunity to belong. As you and I read in our Bibles, we see quite a bit about this. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 is a classic passage. Jesus says in that passage, do not judge. He says, when you judge, judge by righteous appearance. When you look at somebody, recognize that whatever level you judge that person at, they're going to judge you as well. Recognize that they, they need grace just as much as you need grace. We read over in Romans chapter 14, verse 4, and it's interesting how Paul puts it in this passage. He said, you better be careful, because who are you to judge another person's servant? Imagine walking over to somebody's house one day, and you say, man, I don't like your car. It's not the kind of car I would drive. I don't like your house. Their house doesn't measure up to what I'd want it to. And I don't like your clothes, and man, I don't like your TV. And you go through all the things that they have. How rude would that be? And you sure wouldn't make many friends, would you? But how often do we walk up to God's servant, and even if we don't say it verbally, we think it in our mind, that person doesn't measure up to me. And that person doesn't measure up to what I think he needs to measure up. And that person's not pulling his weight the way that I think that he should. But what's amazing is that God doesn't see the outside God sees the heart and so while that person is out there struggling and they have made a major step in faith to even show up on Sunday morning who are we who have an easy life to tell them that they don't measure up when a person is struggling with sin and struggling with a relationship when a person is going through this or that who are we who don't know the whole story to look down upon them and tell them that they don't belong because we don't feel like they've done as much as we have. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12, once again, Paul in that passage, another passage, talks about the importance of judgment. And he says you need to be careful how you judge other people. You need to be careful in how you do these things. Now look with me, if you will, verses 5 through 9. 
And as James here has told us not to show favoritism, as he's given us the illustration, now he tells us why it's such a dangerous thing. You look there in verse 5. And as you read there in verse 5, notice what it is that he says. He says, listen, my beloved brethren, God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which is promised to those who love him. When I show favoritism, I show that I'm against God. Because guess what? God loves strange people. Doesn't that make you feel good, especially if you're strange like me? God loves the people who don't fit in. God loves the people who don't have everything figured out. God loves the people who have not yet arrived, but who are still working on growing. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 15, 1 through 3, who was it that Jesus hung out with? Yes, he spent some time in the temple. Yes, he spent some time with his family. Yes, he spent a good amount of time with the apostles. But if you're looking for Jesus, where would you look? In Luke 15, 1 through 3, you see that he spends time with the outcasts, the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the people who don't belong. If you're looking for Jesus today in Marshall County, where would you look? Would he be here? I sure hope he would. But who would he spend his time with during the week? He'd find the people who don't fit in. He'd find the people who don't belong. He'd find the people who are struggling. He would find the people who needed good news. And so we don't show partiality because we recognize that if we're to be like God... We remember that God loves the poor and God loves the outcast. Proverbs 19, 17, He who lends to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord shall always repay. It's an important passage for us to remember. Verse 6, the rich and the popular, guess what? They will turn on you. As you read over there in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, James goes ahead and explains this a little bit more. And he says, you know, these rich folks oftentimes would try to figure out a way to oppress those who are poor. Those who are wealthy are always looking for ways to get ahead. Be very careful about those folks. Let me let you in on a little secret. If you're around somebody who's always gossiping about everybody else, guess who they're talking about when you're not there? If you're around someone who is always putting everybody down, guess what they're doing when you're not there? When you're around somebody that will only accept you if you continue to serve them and continue to be good to them and continue to give favor to them, guess what's going to happen when they don't need you anymore? Far too often in the church, we're looking for that perfect family that will add to the church and that will make us look like we think we ought to look like and will behave the way we think they ought to behave and all those sort of things. And yes, they need salvation. They absolutely need salvation. But we've got to remember the gospel is for all. And so while the rich need the gospel, remember the poor And the outcasts need the gospel as well. Look there in verse 7. Be very careful, he says in verse 7, because those who are rich oftentimes will blaspheme the name of God. Who do we work to try to impress? You ever think about that? Every once in a while, I've been in a congregation that has somebody who is well known. I remember when I first started preaching, the weatherman came from the TV station, and I was like, whoa, we've got, you know, this guy. This is so great. And I remember talking to him, and of course, I introduced myself in the absolute wrong way. I said, you know, you're only right like 30% of the time. I've got to be right all the time. Weathermen don't like to hear that. But you know, a lot of times people will get so impressed when a politician comes by. 
or people really care about what this Hollywood actor thinks and what this uh, person in the movies will do here or this person on TV will do there. And oftentimes people want to please a politician and they'll you know, say, man, a Christian can only vote for this person. But when we judge ourselves by celebrity, when we think, man, if we had somebody famous on our side, we need to take a step back and realize how rarely politicians live up to our ideals. And we need to take a step back and think about Hollywood and realize very rarely do we want to be sponsored by someone in Hollywood. Are there good actors? Absolutely, they're good people. Are there good politicians? Absolutely, they are. But be very careful when you judge your value on the people who are around you. No matter how perfect a person may seem, if they're not the Lord, they're going to let you down. And they're not going to be what they need to be. So instead of selling out the poor, instead of selling out the outcasts to try to please everybody else, realize that we all stand at the foot of the cross. In verse 8, we read about the royal law that goes all the way back to Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18 and also Matthew 22. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's an important thought. You and I are called to love our neighbor. One thing I enjoyed about living over here, one thing I enjoy about living where I live now, I don't have neighbors. What's it mean to love your neighbor? That question was asked of Jesus, wasn't it? Lord, who is my neighbor? Well, there was a fellow who was walking down the road on his way to Jericho, and he was waylaid by some robbers. And as he laid there on the side of the road, a religious person, a, a priest, came by. This person was someone who preached the word of God, who stood as a stand between, between God and men. But that priest just kept on walking. A little bit later, a Levite came by, a man who was of a tribe that was a fellow Israelite, a man who by law was supposed to stop and to help, a man who his tribe was not given land because they were supposed to be servants of everybody, a man of God. He kept walking by. A little bit later, a Samaritan came by, a half-breed, Somebody who worshipped a different God. Somebody who wouldn't care about that person. Somebody whose society said would have kicked the fella when he walked by because of the hatred that came back and forth from the Ottomans and the Jewish nation just a century before. But this person who should have been an enemy stopped. He bound up the wounds of the person who was there, put him up on his donkey. He went and, get this, Paid his medical bills. Pretty big deal right there, isn't it? And he made sure that he was taken care of. After Jesus tells this parable of the Good Samaritan, he says, now who was his neighbor? You see, believe it or not, that passage out of the book of Luke goes right back here to James chapter 2. Because so often we say the brother, my neighbor, is a person who looks just like me. My neighbor is a person who believes exactly the way that I believe. My neighbor is the one who makes me comfortable. And as a matter of fact, my neighbor is the one who makes me look good. Jesus says that every person is your neighbor. Both the rich and the poor. Both the popular and the outcast. Both those who have always been here and those who don't belong. One thing we always have to remember is the importance of loving our neighbor. Now as you look at verse 9, if you judge by the face, if you show partiality, you commit sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Something I want us to notice right here. I'll let you in on a secret. I've got several graduate and undergraduate degrees and Bible and things such as that. But you know what? Outside of Jesus, I'm a sinner. You may have grown up here and you may belong. You may be new here and you may not belong. 
You may look like everybody else, and you may look like nobody else. But outside of Christ, if you've reached the age of accountability, you're a sinner. Every one of us is equal at the foot of the cross. Every one of us needs God's grace. Every one of us needs God's mercy. Every one of us needs God's love. And every one of us needs God's forgiveness. And if God loved a person enough to give up his son to die on that cross, we as God's followers also have to love that person enough to accept them and make them feel welcome in the church. Going back to where we were when we started this lesson, the child has just finished through the lunch line. They are blown away because of this new school that they're in. And they look around and they find a friend. Somebody who welcomes them. Somebody who talks to them. And somebody who makes them feel special. And because they found this friend, it makes school be such a great experience. Bringing that to a more important place. The least segregated place in the world, at least it needs to be, the church. Somebody walks in here and they feel like they don't belong. Somebody looks at their life and they feel like they're not important. My role and your role is to make that person know that God loves them. Make that person know that they belong. Help that person know that they're loved. That's what the word church means. It's the assembly of God. The people who have been ransomed by the blood of Christ and the people who are being prepared for heaven. Tonight, if you need to be a part of that body, obey the scriptures, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and be baptized. Tonight, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed, Are you washed in the blood, in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood? taking of the Lord's Supper today, and this is your opportunity. You'll go with uh, those who will direct you back to the library area, 332. King of my life, I crown thee now, thy shall the glory Lest I forget thy thorn brown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget Please bow with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day to um, allow everyone to be here today and worship here without any persecution. And we thank you for the leadership of this church, all the elders and ministers, and please guide them in their decision making and choose what's best for this 
church. Uh, we also lift to you all those who are sick um, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, especially uh, Nathan and Fred and anyone else who was listed today, and we ask you to restore them as only you know how. Lord, we know that there are several people here who will be going to school soon or have already gone to school, and please guide them to uh, follow your word there and be strong in you. Thank you for all of the blessings that you bestow on us daily, and please continue to bless us, but also allow us to not take those blessings for granted. Also, thank you for forgiving us of our sins, and please continue to forgive us while also providing a pathway to come back to you. But most of all, thank you for having your son die on the cross so one day we could have a chance to be reunited with you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing one and four, then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the way, onward is our Lord. Jesus saved, Jesus saved, let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saved, Jesus saved, shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory. Jesus saved, Jesus saved. We're dismissed.